So earlier today, as you know, we had the spotlight session. And so this evening, uh, we're going to do another um, with a, a fabulously interesting fellow and an extremely talented film director by the name of Jay Roach. Hello, hello. So let me uh, start by giving you a little bit of background and go into our discussion here. So maybe I can get into me. No, I think we're going to sit. Okay. And, and I've actually, I've never done an interview with a margarita at hand. So we'll see just how well this goes by the end of the hour. It's a lot like dinner theater right now. It, <laughs> just, yeah. So totally buzz killed, completely killed your conversation. But we're going to make this so interesting that you're going to not regret it. We're sure as hell going to try. So let me tell you about Jay Roach. Um, by many accounts, and I mean many accounts, I've researched this thoroughly, Jay Roach is the nicest man in Hollywood. But the interesting thing is he has not, that shortcoming, and in Hollywood that is truly a shortcoming, has not held him back. It's not stopped him from becoming a, a fiercely effective director of, of many, many successful films across many genres. Uh, which is why I think tonight's conversation be can be quite interesting. He's had tremendous commercial success directing the Austin Powers films, Meet the Parents, Meet the Fockers, I mean, some of the most successful comedies in, in Hollywood history. He then has done very interesting pivots into satire. He produced two of the outrageous Sasha Baron Cohen movies, uh, or I should say mockumentaries, uh, Borat and Bruno. So, available to talk about that as well. And in the last several years, he's directed several political films. Uh, Recount, uh, which was about the Bush core presidential election. Game Change, uh, which was about John McCain's uh, selection of his running mate, the delightful Sarah Palin. And he just finished shooting uh, the Lyndon Baines Johnson project, LBJ. Uh, which had done originally for Broadway and now doing as a, uh, as a feature film. Uh, and by the way, if all of that isn't cool enough, he's been married for the last 12, 20 years to a bangle, Susanna Hoffs. I mean, give me a break. So if he didn't have cred before, he's got cred now. Uh, but today, one thing I wanted to start off with was actually uh, a, a recent project, which is, which is now in theaters, uh, a film called Trumbo, um, which is really about the First Amendment. Uh, it's a film about Dalton Trumbo, uh, who is a legendary Hollywood screenwriter, who in the face of the communist witch hunt in the 1940s and 50s, became, certainly in my eyes and many others, a true American hero uh, in defense of the First Amendment and free expression. Um, and, and we'll get into a bit of that. So welcome, Jay. Thanks, thanks for having me. Uh, otherwise known as Mr. Susanna Hoffs, evidently, in this room. Mr. Susanna, <laughs> Mr. Susanna Hoffs. <laughs> I know. <laughs> My own connection. You had to bring that up, Jim. Yeah, I, I gotta I guess come up that, anyway. Don't worry. <laughs> a, a, a bit of disclosure here. Uh, 35 years ago, I was a very, very lucky man in that I convinced a, a very amazing woman by the name of Mitzi Trumbo uh, to marry me. Uh, so Dalton Trumbo, the subject of this film, is, is indeed my father-in-law. Um, and over the years, I got uh, thoroughly immersed in that very close-knit family's history uh, in dealing with the challenge of living through the blacklist. Uh, to not put too fine a point on it, this is a man who went from, and this isn't actually as crisply uh, portrayed in the film as, as, as it really happened, went from being the most highly paid screenwriter in Hollywood to doing movies for small amounts of change. They moved to Mexico because they thought they could live more cheaply there. Uh, my wife, when she was, I don't know, six, seven years old, uh, was kicked out of the junior Girl Scouts uh, because her far father was a commie. Uh, so, so the price that these folks paid uh, during that period was, was quite significant. Um, so, a, a lot of power in the story and, and, and certainly a lot of meaning uh, for the many folks uh, 
who were uh, victims of the blacklist. And, and there were thousands and thousands and thousands of victims of the blacklist uh, in the United States. But over the last two years in the, in the making of the film, I, I had the unique pleasure of, of getting to know Jay and many members of the, of the cast and the, and the fine team that, that put the film together. Um, and I found Jay to be such an interesting guy. And we talked about Newsgeist at one point and he said, that sounds like a really cool event. And so he agreed to come to Newsgeist and I said, great, and maybe you'd actually do one of these AMAs with us. So before we go into that, actually, we'd like to, why don't we just show a, a, a short trailer of Trumbo, which interestingly, I've seen on the, on the monitors about four times today, playing on a ABC and, and, and other television networks since it just went into theaters. I love our country, and it's a good government, but anything could be better. You talk like a radical, but you live like a rich guy. It's like a perfect combination. The radical may fight the purity of Jesus, but the rich guy wins with the cunning of Satan. Your next deal is going to make you the highest paid writer in Hollywood. Where do I sign? Are you not, or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? Many questions can be answered yes or no only by a moron or a slave. No studio will ever employ a member of the Communist Party. Decent Americans feel that Hollywood is just a haven for overpaid traitors. Buddy, I got nothing to say to you. We do what everyone says we can. We write. Are you out of your mind? Congress has no right to investigate what we think or how we make movies. I'll write you a movie. And you don't want your name on it? No, you don't want my name on it. Especially if you're still up to stuff, are you? Perpetually. The blacklist is alive and well, and so is the black market. We should all be prepared to go to prison. I don't think you're willing to lose all of this just to do the right thing. You don't end something like this by giving them but they have no right to ask. Phone for you. Oh, who is it? He's Douglas. But there's a good story in there about one man who tried to take on the whole world. And what's the title? Spartacus. If we get one big movie, we can get all the big movies. Then this whole rotten thing could collapse. If there is some other writer's name on it, don't believe it. Fire Dalton Trumbo. I don't think you and me are going to be pals. You have to say everything like it's going to be chiseled into a rock. Whisper a movie you've written in secret. Maybe I've even heard of it. Maybe you have. So Jay, I'm going to let you start off by you know, introducing a bit more about the about the story of Trumbo, and, and, and as as you're doing it, give us a sense of why you felt it was an important film to make. Well, the what hooked me on wanting to do it was the the guy, he, he, his writing, his his approach to living, his uh, his smart assiness, his his uh, brilliance. Like he, there's so many adjectives about the guy, and I. The screenplay was great. John McNamara wrote a great screenplay. And then I started reading um, the letters he wrote to his family from jail um, and uh, to his friends, to his enemies, and saw what an articulate, uh, eloquent poet he was and, and a prankster at the same time. And, uh, and I also uh, recognized that the themes of... of of uh, a person using their their writing superpower as a, a kind of uh, counter to the fear mongering of people like like Hedda Hopper and the whole um, the whole organization. There was an organization at the time called the Motion Picture Alliance for the Preservation of American Ideals, and it was formed by um, Hedda Hopper. Um, uh, Walt Disney, uh, Ayn Rand wrote the manifesto for it. It was a very um, intensely patriotic, uh, all-American, uh, you know, uh, outfit that invited Congress to come out and clean up 
Hollywood. Uh, and so seeing this guy, plus all the other writers, there were many, many other uh, writers and, and uh, people from other aspects too, directors and producers. But, but Trumbo in particular used his actual wit and his way with words and his great writing and he formed a black market under, during the blacklist and he and a bunch of other writers wrote so many of the of the gr the great movies made during the blacklist under pseudonyms and assumed names. He ended up winning two Academy Awards: one for Roman Holiday, one for A Brave One, and then he wrote Spartacus. And he did that all while blacklisted. And the story of how he and his family um, were kind of bonded by that experience, and it became a sort of uh, almost like a a caper movie in the later part of the story uh, as they figured out a way to expose the lunacy of the blacklist and write some great screenplays along the way. And so I was, I was just hooked by that, that sort of, uh, you know, David versus Goliath, old, old fashioned American <laughs> tale. You know, the, as I mentioned, it's really a film about the First Amendment. The, the lesson, frankly, isn't a terribly heartening one. Um, when they were pulled before the House on American Activities Committee, uh, folks were asked the basic question of, uh, are you now or were you ever been a member of the Communist Party? Uh, many folks who testified uh, pled the Fifth Amendment that they couldn't incriminate themselves, um, and they were blacklisted, but they, um, but they faced no other penalty. The blacklist for many of them was, you know, career ruining, of course. So I don't want to, I don't want to suggest that that was insignificant. But Trumbo um, and nine of his brethren, known as the Hollywood Ten, uh, weren't comfortable with that approach um, because they felt they had done nothing wrong. They had committed no crime, and in truth, they had not. It was not against the law to be a member of the Communist Party, um, uh, which at that time was a very different. Uh, um, you know, it's much more about workers' rights and socialism and so on. It doesn't matter. In any case, when they went before Congress, instead of pleading the Fifth, they pleaded the First Amendment, uh, figuring that that's indeed uh, what they were basing their, their uh, lack of willingness to answer on. Um, and they did so believing that the Supreme Court would uphold that. Interesting, interestingly, the construct of the Supreme Court between the time that they were convicted of contempt of Congress um, and the time that the appeal went to the Supreme Court changed dramatically, and the Supreme Court upheld the conviction. Uh, so he then spent a, a year in jail uh, as a result. So the fact of the matter is, if you look at legal case law and precedent in the United States, uh, you do not have a First Amendment right uh, to refuse to answer questions about your political affiliation before Congress, uh, which is a, a, an uncomfortable uh, a point to conclude. Um, you know, but as you pointed out in your discussions, and, and by the way, I want to make this conversation. This will we, we will talk about Trumbo for a bit, but I think when you when we have the opportunity to have someone from a different profession with us, it's also nice to talk to them about about the nature of their work and how they do it. So, questions tonight can be about anything relating to uh, filmmaking and and, and, and storytelling, uh, and so please uh, take us up on that uh, as we go through this. Um, but, you know, as you've pointed out in other, dis in other discussions, and as we well know um, uh, uh, today, in today's world, that fear is the most irresistible weapon for a politician uh, to use, and indeed the blacklist was just that. Um, do you think that we've really learned any lessons from this? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I, the film tries to raise that very question of like how fragile are these protections? Uh, Trumbo himself used to always say the First Amendment is about protecting unpopular speech because popular speech doesn't need protecting. And this particular, their particular political persuasion happened to be very unpopular in 1947 uh, during at the, at the sort of beginnings, the early years of the of, of the Cold War, and yet. Oh, just a few years before, we were allied with a communist uh, superpower, and uh, artists were joining the Communist Party in, in mostly in uh, sort of sympathy with the union movements, and, and there were tremendous uh, anti-fascist efforts that also uh, allied some of these people. And so it, um, it, it was such a different set of conditions, but when you see how fast fear can whip up the kind of hysteria that's even been going on this week, you know, uh, 
you you do stop to think how how permanent are the protections of the Bill of Rights? How quickly can they be thrown out if we're uh, truly uh, you know uh, uh, get to a point where if if there was there the, the obviously the the tax in Paris triggered uh, the, the the threat of totalitarian communism in those days was real. The threat of t terrorism today is real, but it but it quickly gets spun into something else, a different kind of a, uh, a sort of hysteria that can be used to round up anybody you don't like or anybody who's different from you. Or, and it, I think we do underestimate how quickly that could, could uh, spiral into something much, much more terrible where, where um, people's, people's protections for uh, privacy, for freedom of speech, for freedom of association could be jeopardized. And I, I don't think I don't think you can underestimate, and this, this you know, how, how um, fragile those protections are, I guess. And this, this story is really very much about how, how we, in Hollywood today, to imagine, you know, people, writers and directors and actors actually turning on each other and trying to destroy, actively trying to destroy each other's careers, it's so hard to picture, but it wasn't that long ago. And uh, I, I do think that, that you could write a, a probably pretty interesting speculative fiction, uh, you know, um, series of steps where that could occur again today. Sadly true. Um, I'm going to shift gears a bit. Um, here we are in a room full of folks who are determined to do the best they can at uh, fact-based journalism. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and as we all know, history and the telling of history is in its own realm a very liquid thing. Uh, but then when you introduce Hollywood storytelling uh, to the telling of history, um, things get even softer, or certainly there's the potential for that. Um, and, and interestingly, recently, when the Steve Jobs film came out, there was quite a bit of controversy uh, about the accuracy of the portrayal uh, of, of Steve Jobs. Um, and, and Joe Nacera in the New York Times said, uh, as it turns out, Sorkin is quite proud of his disregard for the facts. He quotes him as saying, what is the big deal about accuracy purely for accuracy's sake? He told New York Magazine about the time the social network came out. The way he sees it, he is no mere screenwriter, rather he's an artist who can't be bound by the events of a person's life, even when he's writing a movie about that person. Um, you, in a sense, faced that challenge uh, with Trumbo, uh, you know, an effort to, to balance storytelling with fact-based history. In, in the film, certainly, as an, a strong essence of truth. Uh, but of course, in the nature of storytelling, many of the details and the portrayals of characters uh, are not historically factual, um, aren't completely true. Um, and, and certainly, from my wife's perspective, um, that was both understandable as the daughter of a screenwriter and also quite challenging as someone who actually lived the period. So tell me, what's your philosophy in, 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 uh, in, in telling history through fictional storytelling? It's a really, uh, it's a constantly uh, perplexing and difficult issue. You know, we think about it all the time. We, we are always trying to get the story right but get this, getting the story right can be different on, a, uh, on different films. On Recount and Game Change, for example, uh, Danny Strong, the screenwriter, and I interviewed dozens of people. We had many, many, uh, um, you know, in Recount, we had something like five books. We were tapped into Jeffrey Tubin and David Kaplan and Jake Tapper. We had, we had interviewed 50 different people, you know, to just try to make sure we got the story right, uh, both I would say both the essential truth of it, but also as much as we could, the, the sort of beat by beat uh, accuracy of it. But all that said, you know, someone asked me in Toronto how, on, on Trumbo how much of, and it's, it's probably gonna sound a little Sorkin-esque, how, uh, how much of Trumbo is not true? And I said, all of it. You realize they're actors, right? It, it didn't just happen in two hours. It was a 13-year process, and uh, uh, we, these are sets, and they're wearing makeup. You know, no, there's no real people in here at all. Um, and I was clearly being facetious, but it is uh, it is an interpretation, and I think it's about the deal you make with the audience. If the audience is expecting um, 
that the story they're watching is, a, is as close to the historically accurate account as they possibly can get, then I think you have a responsibility to deliver on that. If you say this is a true story, you should try as best you can to deliver it. You're still always going to be limited by what's possible in a two-hour you know, uh, interpretation based on performances. But you, know, you, you should try. And in Trumbo, it was a little different because it's a story about a storyteller, for one thing. John McNamara always said it's not this, our particular story isn't history, it's a story about history. There's composite characters. Uh, Arlen Hurd, uh, the Louis C.K. character you saw in the trailer, is a composite of multiple different, um, different uh, several of the different um, Hollywood 10 writers. I think three or four of them are kind of woven in. Buddy Ross, who's a character who's a kind of smarmy producer, is a composite character. And I did a, a very deliberate thing where we used a lot of archival news footage in the film, uh, black and white footage, and then I shot footage of Brian Cranston and other people, so you would see real Ronald Reagan, real as in real from archival footage. You saw, saw real Richard Nixon, uh, people that were involved either as friendly witnesses or who were on the HUAC. And then I cut to Brian Cranston in footage that was degraded to seem like it was the same uh, the shot at the same time to sort of invite you to go back, to use the archival footage as a sort of time machine to go back and, and imagine what it really felt like to be in those hearings. But then we did a very deliberate thing where we dolly in on Brian Cranston as he's saying that line about uh, you can't, I wouldn't be able to, only, only a, a moron or a slave would answer yes or no to a question like this. And we dissolved to color and we pushed the frame edges out to the widescreen format and we put the sound into the surround sound and it and it becomes a completely different thing than the the documentary feel it's a movie it's an interpretation and so back to the essential kind of thing i guess i'm saying is that it's a it's an it's saying to the audience this in particular is a construct this is not history um, this is something else however we worked incredibly hard to make it as authentic as we possibly could. We talked, we got to know Mitzi Trumbo, we got to know Nikki, we, got to, we met Kirk Douglas, we did extensive research to make it authentic. But it's, if we had gotten trapped, or not trapped is the wrong word, if we had been too slavish to the accuracy of the beep, we never could have fit all 13 years into something that was manageable. We couldn't have covered 10 different writers, we couldn't have, uh, dealt with the hundreds of people, but we did want to try to get to the truth of what Trumbo's experience was, his family's, what Hedda Hopper was really like, what John Wayne was really like back then, which is one of the bigger surprises of the movie. And um, all to say, we tried to sort of honor the story, but we could never be the historical account in that in this particular film. Does that make sense? No, I think that makes complete sense. I mean, the, 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 the interesting thing, of course, is that... Um, um, Again, one feeds the other. I, 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 you know, I, obviously, I, I read a lot of the coverage of the film. My, my wife reads every word of coverage of the film. Yeah. Um, and, and you will read an article about the period because of the film that will cite as fact yeah. elements of the film that are purely well, fictional. Well, this is, the, yeah, but, and this now, is I, I, what's and, depressing and, about it. <laughs> but I, I, can't, and I can't blame you for that. I mean, actually... You could, you know, could. and by the way... You should, because it is true that, sadly, uh, many people watching the film will assume this is the history of it. And um, that's, that's a problem, you know? And we, we hoped that, that the film would raise the questions, that we would get to so much of the essential truth you'd want to go, and there's a couple of fantastic biographies, one upon which the film is based, another one that just came out by Chris Trumbo, Dalton's son and uh, Larry Sepler, that somehow we would, most people, many people who see this film go say to, say to us, we, it's astonishing this ever happened. We can't believe the story was never told before. We need to know more about it. But it is, uh, it is a, a challenge. And I, I suppose there are some overlaps with what you all face when you write any story that has to fit in a certain number of column inches and be a certain format and come out a certain way that you can't tell the whole story, but you have to tell it as best you can and you have to get it right. It's just, it's just how 
and, you, and by doing so, you're always leaving something out, you're always compressing something, you're always uh, making a certain selective, a set of selective decisions that have some impact on the story that will be somehow affected by your own particular way of approaching news. But you do the best you can, and you, and you try to get it right. And that, that's what we did, and this particular one, we went at it a little differently than some of the, the ones I've done before. But, um, but it's, it, it, you know, I would tell it differently today. I would make this movie a little differently based on some of the stories we've heard since we made it than I would have. That's the other problem, uh, you know, off of your thing about uh, persistence, the, the session we had earlier today, that you would, I would love to update it. It's one of the weird things, I think, with digital filmmaking, it, would it be possible to have a different version, you know, uh, as, the, as the reaction to the film evolved? In comedy, I always thought, in Borat, I produced Borat, and I was really involved in both setting up the story and also editing it. And I was trying to convince Fox that they should release a different version every weekend because there was so much incredible footage that we never could use, and that would be the way to have people come back to the theater over and over, is wondering what's the next weird thing that that uh, you know that they left out last time. Um, I, I'm going to go to comedy in a second, uh, but but again, in fairness, uh, my my uh, my beef in, in that case really should be with the reporter because here is a journalist. And it does say based on a true story, but you know, here's a journalist who is actually, in a sense, using a a, a bit of Hollywood storytelling um, as 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 source material for for fact-based statements. Yeah. Um, um, I, 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 you know, I, I mean, obviously, one might know better. Uh, in fact, my wife and I now we always joke when we watch any film that says based on a true story. When you see it says based on a true story, start heading to Wikipedia, because it's absolutely fascinating. And based, and Wikipedia is always. 100% accurate. Well, so, I'll, know, I'll, 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 I'll certainly put my bet it's, more on it. Definitely, it's definitely the most accurate, uh, you know, yeah. accounts I see. But, you know, it is, it is that history, uh, you know, as much as it wants to be some kind of uh, concrete scriptural thing, it, 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 there, there are different accounts, you know. Right. And, and I think even if we had, depending on who we talked to, this movie could have been very different if we had gone with, even, even between the two sisters of Trumbo, uh, we we would have told completely different stories uh, based on the two accounts of the two of the two daughters. Um, uh, yes, <laughs> indeed. Uh, we we won't go there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, it is an interesting point, though. Uh, they managed uh, Jay managed to land Elle Fanning uh, in this key role, and Elle Fanning is a very hot young actress today, and I mean hot in the popular Q rating version sense, as uh, opposed to uh, um, yes uh, exactly. since she's 17 I need to be careful about my yeah. words um, yes. but nonetheless you land someone like that you have to give them a meaty role and so right. you, you so conflate it into a singular character exactly we the two daughters are sort of combined into to Elle Fanning which because we knew we had one great actress and we but that was a, that's the kind of story as a storyteller you do have an obligation to an essential truth, but you have maybe even a bigger obligation to make sure the story is so compelling, people will want to talk about it and want to learn more about it, and that requires it to be entertaining. It actually has to be entertaining. And you'll see, there's a, if you, any of you get to see it, that there's a fair amount of comedy in the story, too. Uh, Louis C.K. has a few uh, scenes. There, it's very serious, and the stakes are very high, but there are moments as these guys try to joke their way through the... the, the injustices that are very funny. And that's, that was also part of our, oblig we felt the obligation to be tr authentic to tr who Trumbo was and the Hollywood 10. They were very funny people. You know, they were, uh, they were, they were pranksters, and, but they were also had a humanism that you, can, you don't get through that kind of stuff without humor. You're always, you're always uh, to some extent trying to commiserate with each other and, and find the ironies and the absurdity, absurdities uh, through, through the common experience of it. So let's, let's actually shift to comedy. Um, yeah. Because obviously that uh, was, uh, you know, your, your, your very popular early films are all comedy. And, and it has been an element in, in most, if not all of your films, uh, not just the ones labeled comedies. Uh, there's this general belief, uh, I, I sense, that people feel that doing serious drama is hard and doing comedy is easy. But I've always suspected from my discussions with folks in the industry that it's actually quite the reverse. Uh, and I remember uh, 
in one instance, uh, in, in talking with you um, about this, I uh, can't remember when and where, you said when shooting a comedic scene um, that you cringe when the crew reacts with laughter because you feel that the crew's response is, is by no means a dependable stand-in for how the audience will respond. So yes. talk about, yeah. Well, that's a spe very specific part of it is just that actors, when they hear the crew laugh, they assuming, they're assuming that it's going to be hilarious in the movie too, so they should keep doing it. Robert De Niro is an incredibly... Uh, capable actor, but part of what the crew is laughing at when he does something weird or or is is that it's Robert De Niro <laughs> doing it, you know, uh, doing something funny, and it's not necessarily the character played much better if he was straight and dangerous, and from Ben Stiller's point of view and Meet the Parents, a killer who wanted to use you know CIA techniques to root out his bullshit, you know, and that was that's what made it funny, not that he was that he could crack the crew up but that's just one of the that's just one of the you know the quirks of trying to create an environment where um, the actors can be true to the characters but still find some kind of abs you know uh, absurdity or or tap into an anxiety I might my, my, often in my comedies I try to tap into some kind of a uh, insecurity or pain or <laughs> because those things are funny to me because I they're therapeutic for me as well. I was very much a Woody Allen fan, so when I, you know, when I saw Annie Hall and saw, saw oh, dysfunction is, is, is okay. You know, you can. There's humor in dysfunction. Uh, it's not for everybody that kind of humor, but it definitely was therapeutic to me. But I sense a part of your uh, approach as well, which which I don't think is true of all directors, is you like to get reactions to the work in progress yeah. uh, during the editing processes and so on and so forth that you and, and maybe this is more true of comedy than not that you're that you're doing a lot of tuning as yeah, it were. Yeah, we test we test screen it a lot and we record how it plays we even record the you know the the kind of the verbal the the laughter or whatever and see how it how whether we've timed it out right we put it back into the editing machine and sort of Measure, but it's partly because I, I guess I look at, you know, I, I remembered reading about the Marx Brothers getting to workshop their comedies. They would go and perform them live on the road for a while and see how jokes played, and then they would come in and shoot them. And for us, that's you just play it for for audiences and and see if it's if it's if it dies, you know, over and over and over, and it's just uh, sad. You thought it was hilarious, and it's just not only is it not hilarious, it's the audiences resent it, you might want to cut that out. <laughs> and so if I'm, and I feel like if it's sort of like a conversation, if I'm telling you a joke at dinner and you're checking your watch, then uh, next time I might tell it better. You know, I might tell it faster, I might cut something out. So I, in the dramas, I don't do that quite as much, but I still like to do it because there's always something confusing. In Trumbo, communism was, in, in, in the story, I knew it would mean something different to today's audience than it meant to those to those men who, who were, part of it at that time, and I wanted to hear about it. So I ran my own focus groups and would screen it for 100 people and then ask them to tell me what they thought. And, uh, and you know, not slave, I would never take their notes and say, oh good, now we're, the audience told us what it should be. But I would listen and try to adjust certain elements that were confusing or off-putting that were not essential to the story and we're only just distracting from what I did care about about the story, what mattered to me about the story. So I do that a lot. So if, I'm going to shift gears uh, one more time. Um, in, in my view, we're living in a true golden age of, of television. Um, we have so many That's fabulous right. long-form yeah. series, you know, Breaking Bad, obviously, Brian's uh, uh, great series, The Wire, Fargo. If you're not watching Fargo, by the way, Pure poetry. Transparent, too. I, I, Transparent. Transparent. It's amazing. Um, yeah. Sopranos, obviously. Yeah. And, and you've obviously focused your career on, on, on feature-length films. Are, are you enticed by, by maybe going into yes, long form? Yes, I am. On my deals at HBO through the films, we did a show called The Brink, uh, which was hit and miss <laughs> and has now been canceled, sadly. Um, but I think it's some of the better... You know, a lot of people in film are gravitating to to HBO, Amazon, Netflix, a number of, of people who are, who are doing longer form stuff because it's, it's more like writing a novel. It's more like, 
it's inviting the audience to to get connected to characters and 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 live you know and I think HBO kind of blazed that trail with The Wire and uh, and Sopranos in particular, but you know there are other examples. There are great examples in in um, you know the BBC was doing uh, with uh, Prime Suspect. And there's a, no, a number of of shows that have opened that door, and I think because we're finding in feature films, no one's paying attention to. Uh, adult, you know, to, to stories that are made for adults anymore, really. Um, I was just reading that, you know, Spotlight is, I haven't seen Spotlight. Um, I wish I was, I wish I had made that movie. One of my best friends made that, uh, Tom McCarthy, who played Dr. Bob in Meet the Parents. He was the uh, rival uh, doctor compared to Ben Stiller's nurse uh, character. <laughs> and he now, he's a great director. He did Station Agent, The Visitor, Win Win, and, and now uh, Spotlight, which I'm so happy that another movie re-legitimizing journalism has occurred. Um, uh, so I just, but I, you know, I don't think those movies don't, not enough people are going to see them. So people are staying home and watching House of Cards and Veep. And so if you want to do a political something, then it's probably better to try to do it for a lot of us to do it on, uh, do it in long form TV. I'm going to ask one more question, and then we're going to open it up. So start thinking about what questions you might like to ask. Uh, and I'm going, to, I'm going to shift gears one more time. Uh, you know, everyone in this room is here to, to build a better news ecosystem on the Internet. Yeah. Um, and the Internet has obviously had a, a, had a massive impact on how content in all its forms is, is distributed and accessed. Um, and, and we talked about this once uh, several months ago. Uh, and you mentioned to me how dramatically different the financial structure and rewards are right. uh, uh, between, for instance, studio-financed films and, and independently distributed films. I, I, I think if this is not inappropriate, you mentioned that you had made significantly more money off of Barat than you had made off of the first Austin Powers or something oh, yeah. to that yeah, effect. Yeah. If it's, uh, Chatham House rules, by the way. <laughs> um, um, do you do you see a day when you might uh, self-distribute? Uh, what's your what's your thinking? Oh, about that's this? an interesting question. I don't know. I like. I do. I, I do admit that um, the mechanisms in place for for uh, studio distribution. I produced recently uh, the Tina Fey, Amy Poehler movie Sisters, which is coming out. I guess this this uh, and. I was said in one of the marketing meetings, and you know, Universal has bought stakes in so many of of the internet outlets that you realize that uh, you could never compete. This little company that's distributing Trumbo is called Bleecker Street. They made it up out of uh, some finance, personal money, and uh, they hired people from Focus Films. But compared to the the vertically integrated corporate distributors and and marketeers. I think it's, I don't know if I want to be in that part, but I do love the idea of, of being able to make short films that go right up on YouTube. That, and I'm trying to get my sons to get in that business, but I, I don't think I could do, I don't see myself doing features or, you know, or TV direct to, direct to, I, I think someday that's, wow, well, we'll all do it, but it's not, it's not there yet. Great, let's... Uh Open up the floor. I see one over there. I think there are mics. We have a... Yeah, uh, hey, um, you, you talked about uh, Spotlight, which uh, many of us have seen as just a fantastic movie. Yeah. And also, um, in the same context, talked about uh, the promise of television. What about a television series for HBO or, or Netflix celebrating journalism? Um, I, I mean, a, a lot of us grew up with Lou Grant... Um, so I bet we could. You didn't like the newsroom. Advance that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sort of. Uh, yeah. Um, I I think it'd be amazing. I mean, I, I I you know all the president's men maybe the second after Annie Hall the second reason I went to film school I, I fulfilled a degree in journalism at at school communications and journalism and I wrote for the paper and I worked on the radio station. I mean I. I I've, and often my favorite stories are from the point of view of the journalist, even if they're they're sort of not the the driving force or the antagonist or whatever. That that uh, so I I would if you have one, uh, you know, uh, send send me a good journalism story. I'd be very interested. Thank you. you gotta get about 50. <laughs> uh, 
should, oh, I have a mic. Uh, what is the best uh, deleted Borat scene that we have not seen? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, I'm trying to think. Um, there were some good ones. Um, <laughs> we did one. This can't go out, though, right? You guys aren't going to... Well, uh, we did a scene where um, he, get, he just thinks he's getting a job... Uh, in a hotel um, being a busboy, but he doesn't realize he's being, I mean, a bellman. He doesn't realize he's being a bellman cast in a porn film. And so they, we shot a scene with, with porn actors that didn't know um, that he was uh, a character, you know, that he was Sasha Baron Cohen. They thought he was a, 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 a journalist who was trying to learn about America, but was working as a, a bellman, and so they bring him into the hotel room, and the woman tries to have sex with him, but he do, he's not interested in her because he likes women that are, um, <laughs> uh, what's the right, <laughs> I don't know how to say this, uh, that are not shaved. <laughs> so he likes women with bushy, yeah, that's, so that's, yeah. This, this is a profession that I have in my life, that I work on films that are about this stuff. It was a really funny scene. I will tell you that I pitched, I'll tell you something that didn't happen. Also, I pitched the sequel to Borat, which was that Kazakhstan uh, decides that what they, um, what, what's the difference between, or why they're not a first, considered a first world nation around the world is that they don't have, a, they don't have an agreed upon state religion. So they send Borat out to all, all over the world to find the state religion he should bring back to, uh, to Kazakhstan. It turned out, I, the director was Larry Charles who ended up directing Religious, so Bill Maher kind of did it. But Sasha said, you, you should just shoot me now before I, before I start making this movie. And then they decided not to do it. So it was, that was the sequel that was never made. Jeff. I want to hear more about your sons and YouTube. What do you think the opportunity is for them there, and what's their reaction back? Um, you know, my one son is a very um, kind of esoteric. He's a poet. He writes, he's a full, and he, he would, I think he would, um, He's an artist, you know, and I, I, he'll, the things he's interested in, I don't think will ever be commercial. So I would love him to, to do very, very personal, artistic films. His actual, his actual interest is to take, to, to do, to make purely artistic games. He wants to be a gamer, but they, he wants to, he thinks that's the future of artistic expression, which I'm like, that sounds amazing, and you should, you should, do that. the other one is a pure, um, you know, pure commercial, wants to do big comedies and horror films, actually really into horror films. So he, he's, he, I, you know, to do a, an eight minute kind of cool, ki you know, a, a cabin in the woods type film and get it up on YouTube, he's going to try to do that. So I, 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 that's, he said, I'm doing that next summer. So we'll see what happens. Next question. I can't believe you don't have more questions about like Borat or any of these fine things. Someone asked me today uh, about Borat and the rights issues of Borat. Like, do people sign sign the rights? I was sued 15 times personally with my name on the lawsuit, um, and uh, the you know there was so much stress about it. But in some of these cases, um, you know, it was, I always thought we actually deserved to lose because some of the people who were um, uh, caught on film, even a guy that Borat would go up to a guy on the street and go, I am Borat, I want to kiss you. And the guy would run away. And that, a guy, one person like that sued us. And the judge in New York said that Sasha's right, his, his, his uh, how did she put it? The social benefit of Sasha doing what he does trumped that man's right to privacy. Is that, it's like still astonishing to me. <laughs> the I, I, studio I, indemnified I, us, so I wasn't gonna have to pay for, for, for that person's personal uh, therapy for the rest of his life, but, but I probably should have. I, I recall one of your line producers telling me she was arrested in New York yeah, while yeah. shooting Barrett. How, many, oh, how she, many arrests occurred in the shooting of the um, film? We, no one was ever arrested. Sasha was always on the edge of 
being arrested or being physically harmed. We had a, I wasn't on the set all that much. I couldn't go on the set because I, I actually felt that I would blow the cover by just running up to people and saying, shut up, don't say anything else. It's all going to be used against you because I, I just worried for the people who were being interviewed. So, I, so, so Larry did a great job directing, but um, the rule was whenever Sasha was about to get in trouble, everyone would glom onto the police. They would just go and talk to the police so he could, he could get away. Um, and that always, that always seemed to work. He, and I, always, I used to say whenever, Sasha was the funniest when the sirens were audible in the distance. <laughs> When the police were on the way, that's when it would really get interesting. And um, she got arrested because in one scene, uh, Borat rents a hotel room and it, assumed it, was so, it cost so much money, he assumed he was buying the hotel room and owned all the furniture. And so he shoves all the furniture in the elevator and then the lobby door opens and all the furniture gets kicked, pushed out into the lobby because he's got to take it with him. And... Um, they couldn't shoot that scene in the hotel where they had shot the scene in the room, so they took some of the furniture to another hotel uh, and shoved it out of the elevator. And Monica was, uh, they were gonna come and arrest Sasha for theft, you know, stealing, <laughs> stealing his furniture. And um, she did that, where she just glommed onto the police first and they took her to jail. She spent the night in them, that one of the, the tubes or one of these, like the, one of the really tough uh, municipal holding areas, and uh, that, that's like a real line producer. That's what you want. Someone will go to go to jail for you. I, Tanit. Oh, sorry. Ooh, we got questions. Okay, uh, Tanit's got the mic. Okay. You're next. I, I didn't know about your wife being a bangle, so if you could um, use us, <laughs> how, how do you meet a bangle and, yeah. and marry one? <laughs> that's hilarious. Um, I met my wife on a blind date uh, 25 years ago. Um, and it was an interesting story, only I'll tell it really quick because it was ultimately kind of romantic, but it was sort of ridiculous too. Uh, I, was, I had no money, I was a professor at USC, I was uh, a writer, but I wasn't a very good writer, so I, wasn't, I was kind of going nowhere fast. I had a, a motorcycle and a VW bus that would catch on fire almost every third time. I had a pillow on the back to put it out, and that's what I, I met her, I drove the bus to this restaurant, and it was a blind date uh, with a host couple and three other couples, all of whom were being set up on blind dates. The woman who was the host's wife didn't show up and neither did the other two women. So Susanna was the only girl and there were three eligible bachelors and one host. So it was actually the dating game. And I, I go, and all of them were hitting on her and she was a rock star and I, I, they were, one was an agent, one was a Geffen executive. And I was a professor at, you know, at, at film school, and I, but I got there early. That was the, I got there early, I got to talk to her, and, uh, and, um, and we, we got together, and 25 years later, there you go. That's how you meet a bangle. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, my question was gonna be, was gonna mention your wife, but only as an excuse to mention her, because for a lot of women in this room, I can't that, wait to tell that band that was very, very we important about her. to us. That was a very important, they What's were, that? They were, I'm saying her band was very important to oh, a lot of the women so in this room. Cool. But, but the question I wanted to ask you um, that I was gonna use as an excuse to mention your wife was about women in Hollywood. And I wanted you yeah. to talk about um, Tina and Amy and their, yeah. what, what you're doing with them and just about you know, women in Hollywood right now and what you're seeing and what you think. Well, it's a problem, you know, the, the, the lack of, um, the lack of a sort of even anything close to anything of, to a proportional representation, but it's, it's way worse than that. And I think it's just, um, just like all uh, almost, uh, um, what's the right word, sort of evolutionary tra trends in a business like that that's so male dominated for so many years. Ironically, there's a fair number of, of studio executives, uh, heads, of, heads of studios that are women. So you would have thought Amy Pascal, Stacey Snyder, um, Donna Langley runs Universal now. You would have thought more women would have been uh, promoted, especially into the directing. I, I don't know the percentages, but it's, it's in the teens, you know, of women directors. And uh, it's just, it's just an endemic thing. You know, I, I love working with Tina and Amy. Paula Pell, who wrote the screenplay, is an amazing woman who you'll hear so much more about. It's her first produced screenplay, but she wrote for 30 Rock, wrote for SNL, 
Um, they've been, we've been calling her the third sister of that triumvirate because the, the movie is based on her diaries. Um, the whole thing is. Uh, and, you know, I, there are lots of people very actively, uh, what's the right word, just considering the issue, especially right now, because it's come up, you know, and there's no good, there's no good defense for, for, how, for how it is. It's, um, so hopefully that the fact that it's come up so, uh, so uh, I, there was a great article in the New York Times uh, with all the photos of all the cool people they've talked to. I mean, I think that's, a, that's hopeful. There's, there's some, some slight bit of optimism that comes out of it. It's come up so, uh, so effectively. We, we've, we have a couple of projects. I have, a, you know, have you ever heard of a woman named Katia Lund? She co-directed City of God, and uh, she's like a fantastic. So she's doing a film of ours, um, if we can ever get it off the ground, about um, Mukhtar Bibi, who was, it was a crazy story. The Malala story sort of became, out, out, uh, became a, a much bigger story for for good reasons. But she was the woman who was gang raped in Pakistan, and then used the money that Kristoff. Uh, uh, at, at the New York Times um, helped her raise to, to, to start a whole bunch of schools for women in, in Pakistan. And we've been trying to get that off the ground forever and Katya is still trying to do it. But yeah, I don't, have a, I don't really have a, a good sense of how to fix it, but I'm just glad everyone's talking about it. So uh, I, didn't I didn't realize, hi, over here. I didn't realize you were involved in so many things I, I really enjoyed, so this is a real pleasure. Good job, Thank Richard, you. I guess. Thank you. Uh, so I, um, my question is, you know, you make things that are insanely attractive and, and, and good and that people enjoy so much. Have you seen acts of journalism uh, that you can point to where they did adhere to a real reporting ethic that are anywhere close as interesting as that? And what could we do to get there, do you think? Well. I, you know, I'm, I'm so humbled by even being here. I was sitting in the sessions today just feeling like such a sellout <laughs> because what you guys do, what, what you all do is, I, I'm a news junkie. I read so much news every day. Um, I, there's, you know, 10 amazing stories I've read. The, the, the story that, that, got me and makes me want to tell a story about it is the Koch brothers having their own CIA. You know, did you read that story recently? Their own intelligence gathering outfit, like the 20, a staff of 25 people, mostly to counter what they're being investigated on by journalists and by, like that's a, like how did they figure, like that's great reporting to get to that. I read a great uh, story today. Uh, I read the New York Times a lot, but I read, I go on Google, I read Huffington Post, I read The Atlantic, I read Salon, I read, you know, I, I just am, it's a, it's a problem actually how much I read. Um, the, the story about the, the three women, uh, Syrian refugees, uh, I think they were interviewing them in Turkey about their, uh, about the, excuse me, the ISIS, the, the women who'd been part of ISIS, uh, it's an amazing story. I mean, I, you know, so I, I, I actually literally, without faux humility, this is true humility, I just bow before you guys who do the work, who risk your lives, who, who go out, risk your, your, uh, your, your sort of, um, what's the right word, your, your personal reputation and identity to, to, to talk about things that are not easy, are not popular, are not, you know, and that's, I, that's sincerely why I do want to make stories about journalists because in a way, uh, that's what Trumbo was. You know, he was a person who spoke about civil rights and spoke when no one was. He spoke about union rights when the studios were forming friendly unions to, to sort of sap away all of the, the regular union representation. He, he was a person who believed so much in politics that he performed his ideas like an old fashioned orator. He would stand on a soapbox and just try to get the story out, you know, because no, people weren't doing it. And uh, that's, that's what is, I haven't seen Spotlight yet, but I, I'm sure that's what's amazing about it. So I have nothing to advise you. I want your advice back to me on the kinds of stories I should be telling, because I do want to tell more stories. I want to try to use film, uh, even though it's less and less popular to do this, to use film to raise questions that then people want to go and find out what you guys are writing that's the real, the real, the real story. I wonder 
two stories you've always wanted to tell that you haven't been able to yet? Like the two that just the longest you've been thinking about? Uh -huh. You know, um, one of the stories, it's, uh, it sounds so, I don't know, it's, 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 it's such an old interest of so many people that it's not, a, it's, it'll sound so unoriginal, but I always wanted to tell the story of Joseph Goebbels, the, 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 the propagandist propagandist, you know, who was, who was, uh, and the story of the Poison Kitchen, do you know the Poison Kitchen was a, the Munich uh, newspaper that caught on to Hitler before anybody else was willing to really fight him. The, the journalists were, many of them shipped off to, eventually shipped off to concentration camps, killed, the, 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 the paper was leveled and he had the actual address removed from the city uh, because all, he of course won and, and they lost. But that story of the battle for the ideas that led to the rise of the Third Reich that Goebbels won with, with the help of people like Leni Riefenstahl and like that story is, is just, I can't, you know, then that's what I mean by, I'm so aware of how quickly something could, could a, a civilized society, a, a great society that it of course endured World War I and all, all of the chaos post World War I, but that, that every civil protection, every, every humanistic instinct, every impulse that we all count on just, just went away because because these other ideas were made more contagious, more potent in some way, is it's just astonishing. And I don't, I don't know how to make it entirely something that people today would, I can't wait to see that Goebbels story, you know. I, but but I, I, it's the story that I think might tell us the most about what could, could happen. Um, so that's one I'm trying to think of. Uh, we tried to tell, I tried to tell the Lance Armstrong story. I thought that was a fascinating, I mean, I am fascinated by the, the, the sort of driven narcissists, you know, and Lance was a, a great, but Stephen Frears got the jump on us and uh, we, we, we had Bradley Cooper and we had a giant budget and we were going to shoot that because the, the whole doping culture of that was, uh, but I'll tell you, most of the stories I'm interested in are spin doctors. I just am fascinated with propaganda and how ideas are, especially bad ideas, are made contagious. That's what Trumbo's about. The bad idea that, that these men were trying to uh, corrupt America and uh, cast a, a spell that would turn the American population into communist apparatchiks who would subscribe to the Communist Manifesto through movies like Roman Holiday <laughs> and uh, you know a guy named Joe, 30 Seconds Over Tokyo. He wrote these amazingly patriotic movies that were supposedly hypnotizing Americans to get on board with Stalin. That was the bad, that was a very bad read of what was going on and it became very popular very quickly. So how do bad ideas get turned into good ideas in, in, with spin and how do good ideas get turned into bad ideas? And that's something you guys I'm sure think about all the time, and I just, I, I'm fascinated by the propagandists. Oh, hey, Jay, yeah, I'm just curious to hear more about the story of how you went from the guy with the Volkswagen bus to being producer, director of all these amazing, huge hit movies. Like, what was <laughs> oh, the man. turn? Oh man, mostly luck. What was the critical moment? There's a weird connection between Hitler and Austin Powers, and I, it's, I know it's hard to, uh, we, we talk, I'm so, so funny, we talked about this before, uh, um, but we, uh, you know, I was obsessed with this World War II history stuff, and Mike Myers is a history nut, and he uh, asked me to help him. I, we knew each other through our wives. Um, Susanna has always been a good luck charm for me, and uh, he, uh, we started talking about, I also was interested in Monty Python and Woody Allen, and he said, will you read my script and help me find a director? It was kind of like when Dick Cheney was looking for vice presidents. <laughs> He said, will you help me find a director? And I was combing through director's reels and I found one, this really great guy uh, who ended up doing a few other things later, but he was a commercial guy. And I said, this is the guy. And he said, ah, I already put you up for the job. And I, I, I was like, what? I, I've never, I hadn't directed anything. I, I would, and I, sure enough, when I went to the studio, they said, who are you? We, you're, we're not just gonna, you're not funny. You don't have any, I'd written mostly science fiction and, and weird movies about, you know, I, I wrote a lot of weird stuff. And he said, uh, they said, who are you? Know, so I, I, I pitched them a sequence I had come up with in Austin Powers, which was about the fembots, which were these robotic um, vixens who were trying to keep, and he has to seduce them to get 
to, and uh, the, I made them laugh and they, they hired me. And that, once I got that film, then everything. But up until then, I, had, I was so poor <laughs> and so, so much of a loser. Uh, I'm, and Su Susanna, um, I met Susanna when I, I couldn't have, dif if there was a dictionary entry in, or a Wikipedia entry for a loser, I would have happily been the, because I had, I had no success and she had some weird instinct. So it was, it was Susanna and Mike Myers and Hitler. That's, uh, that's all I can say. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, yeah, that was, that, that project, that was the greatest adventure for me. Um, you know, I was just talking to a man who's here who, I forgot your name. Mizell was in Tallahassee um, working for the Tallahassee paper when this all went down. And we shot in Tallahassee and we did all our research in Tallahassee. Um, I got onto that because Sidney Pollack was going to direct it. My hero, Sidney Pollack, who was a mentor and a buddy, and he got sick. And he said, he had heard that I, I was doing a Mark Felt story. Uh, we, we're still, actually, I might produce this movie about uh, Mark Felt, uh, Deep Throat, um, a, a sort of Rashomon of Watergate, uh, um, All the President's Men. Um, and he, I, we didn't get that off the ground at the time, but he'd heard I was doing political stuff, and he said, I'm sick and I need you to take this over. So it was a crazy, mixed, horrible, emotional thing. But I dropped in, helped him, helped them get it going, and then uh, prepped it and shot it. But the, it's, one, you know, it's one of those times that you'll, I, I'm starting to see this pattern, the interest in when it's revealed how fragile everything is that glues us all together. That was a time when it could have the, my, my favorite thing I learned doing that film was I went to a, an election person in Palm Beach and we were trying to, we were just talking about how the punch card, the punch ballots were so ineffective and the butterfly ballots were so uh, confusing to people and it all came down to the technical weird minutia. There's a great, I'm actually really proud of the animated sequence that explains how punched chads could end up being dimpled, hanging, or true perforations. Like, there's a whole animated sequence in our movie about that. It was actually people came up and said, now I finally get the whole hanging Chad thing. <laughs> and, but the guy said, you know what, what is interesting about the electoral process? When you have a good electoral process, if when it's over, the loser says, I salute you, I concede, you won, fair and square, go forward, good luck, you know, uh, that's a, that's a successful process. But if you have a process that's not uh, accepted as being a good voting process, then the loser is gonna contest that. People are gonna get behind the person who lost and say that person really won. It's what happens in third world countries, you, you know, the Ukraine, there's a whole history of, and, and uh, uh, Minnesota, is that where Al Franken won the recount? Yeah. yeah, it happens in uh, the Ukraine and Minnesota. And, uh, <laughs> And those that when it falls apart like that, it's 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 rough. I mean, a, a, a country can can go to war over a contested election. It's happened many, many, many times. I, and I, I always tell that story that the guy was in this philosophical thing. He said in the history in medieval times, when there were the disputes about um, who was the the rightful heir to the throne, the king would die and. Uh, there, there'd be all this talk about, well, this guy was the real son, but that one was the half-brother, and that was, you know, and so it was like, oh, who's the real king? A guy would write in with, with like five of his toughest knights or whatever and say, I'm the king, and if anybody disagrees with this, fight me right now or shut up forever. And that's how you, if you, if everyone said, okay, God lived, you know, God's, you're, you long live the king, you were fine. But if, it, if, he, if people didn't accept it, they would go to war. And that's what it seemed like we were almost on the edge of that. Not, not for real, for real, but it was if Al Gore had kept suing in the Supreme Court, which he was tempted to do, and if it had, who knows what would have happened. So anyway, that, that I'm really interested in how, how we stay glued together. And we did stay glued together. We have uh, um, Tom Wilkinson as, um, as, um, Oh, shit, who's the, the, who fought the, 
James Baker, uh, giving the speech at the end saying, you know, tanks didn't go on the streets, there weren't riots, we, fi we figured it out. But he, it almost didn't happen that way. So anyway, that's, that was the same uh, drive to make, to make recounts. And, you know, that whether, I don't know if, I don't think in, in, the, in Game Change when Sarah Palin was chosen as the, uh, the running mate for John McCain, we quite got to that place, but it, it felt like that's really, that's, that's, that's it, where's the Abe Lincolns and the Je Thomas Jeffersons? It's gonna be John McCain and Sarah Palin. That's, I wanted to know how that, how does that happen? So all of my films have been therapeutic to just try to figure out how, do, how how's this gonna work out? <laughs> how I, then I, shall we live? I, I fear this coming election is gonna give you ample opportunity for at least one more But I can't, election I can there's nothing that can top what's going on in real life now. I'm not, I won't even, I'm not even thinking about trying to make a well, film. Uh, well, Jay, I, I just, uh, this has been a tremendously fun and, and, and insightful conversation. I, I really thank you very much for, for taking the time with us and please a thanks from all of us. Thank you so much, thank you. Thanks a lot. I can't wait to tell my wife that, that uh, I got to talk about Susanna. That's, that's what she's going to care about. <laughs> it says, ask me anything. So we have. So Thank you, guys. It's really cool to be here. Thank you. Ten minutes for folks to say, refresh their drinks, and then we're going to do the next round of Ignite Talks, and we've got some good ones.